The Sisterhood by Robert E. Dillon. All right. Inside an apartment building in the lobby during the day, a drab paint peeled wall frames an elevator door. Two women in fair weather hip hop attire approach. Each is crowned with a rolled up pink and black bandana. Mom, 20, an African American, presses the down button. Her eyes cast a stone cold vibe that hides her kind hearted nature. You need to get some sleep. Trigger, 19, a diminutive Puerto Rican with a hot temper and a cold heart, folds her arms and presses her back to the wall. How much of this shit we gonna take? Say we grip up, get murk those thoughts. Mom glares at her. Trigga rolls her eyes and exhales in acceptance of Mom's decision. Ding! The doors open, revealing Liberty Payne, 18, a biracial beauty rocking a preppy urban style. She wears a backpack slung over her shoulder and clutches the strap with one hand, thumbs through her phone with the other. She almost walks right into Mom and Trigger before lifting her head and stopping abruptly. Oh, sorry. The girls grill her with their eyes. Liberty skirts around them and continues through the front door. Mom and Trigger step into the elevator and the door closes. Liberty pockets the phone and steps outside onto the apartment out onto the sidewalk and walks along the side of the building to wait for the light to change. Cars roll by. In each one, Liberty catches glimpses of a bum, 40s, leering at her from the opposite corner. She changes course and crosses to the corner diagonal from him. The light turns green and Liberty crosses and continues in the direction she was originally headed. The bum keeps pace with her on the other side of the street. She walks faster, but so does the bum. Liberty reaches back for her bag and shifts it so that the bulk of it rests on her hip. She unzips it halfway and slides her hand inside. The bum waits for a break in the traffic and races to Liberty's side of the street and trails her by a few yards. She whips around and stares him down. Why are you following me? He slows his advance, wary of what she might have in the bag. Back the fuck up. The bum stops and raises his palms. What's the matter? Liberty cocks her head in a way that suggests last chance. What you got in there? Come any closer, you'll find out. You scared? Don't be scared of me. Fuck off. What's the matter? I'm trying to be your friend. I'm going to count to three. Don't want to be my friend? One. The bum looks around. Two. Liberty starts to withdraw her arm from the bag. The bum raises his palms to his shoulders. Hey. He turns around and slinks back towards the corner. Liberty breathes a sigh of relief and watches him go. Outside a high school, a large brick building looms over the urban landscape. It stands like a relic from another time, out of place among the pizza shops, bodegas, and hair salons that surround it. Inside, students wait in line to be scanned. It's Liberty's turn. A safety agent takes her bag and places it on a conveyor belt and hands her a small bin. Liberty looks at it, perplexed. Keys. Liberty drops her keys in the bin. The safety agent takes it. She walks through the scanner. Her bag slides along the conveyor belt without triggering the alarm. That's right, she bluffed the bum. Liberty grabs her bag and slings it over her shoulder as we cut to the third floor of Private Isaac Cortez Academy in the hallway. Liberty's bag swings off her hip as she shuffles through a swarm of students. Liberty stops outside a room and checks her schedule and enters room 313. Two dozen students settle into their seats. Ten empty desks remain. Liberty makes for one in the back next to a kid who's asleep. More on him in a minute. For now, let's meet the teacher, Mr. Roth, who's in his 40s, a wolfish figure in a polo shirt. He takes attendance at the front of the room and gazes over the class and marks them off one by one. He gets to Liberty's name and stops. 
looks to her. Miss Payne? She nods. He continues taking roll. Liberty looks around. Most of the kids are engaged in conversation or focused on their phones. The few who aren't have their heads down. Roth slaps the folder on his desk and strides to the front of the room. The murmurs subside. This guy commands respect. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to begin. That's the cue. The phones are put away and the heads come up, all except for one. At the desk next to Liberty is Adiz Marquis, Mar Marquisic? 19, first generation Albanian American, tall, handsome, athletic, and out cold. Students giggle as Roth paces towards Adiz. He reaches him and stops and taps him on the shoulder. No response. Mr. Marquisic. <clears throat> Mr. Marquisic. Adis lifts his head and looks around with bloodshot blue eyes. What'd you smoke for breakfast? Most of the class bursts into laughter. Liberty looks away, uncomfortable with Roth's approach. Adis sits up and opens his notebook. Roth moves to a projector cart in the center aisle. There's a laptop on top of it. Adis notices Liberty. He can't help but smile. She blushes, welcoming his eyes. Roth pulls the cart front, cart's front panel down, allowing the light from the projector to display the laptop screen. On the whiteboard, the essential question, what is the nature of morality? Do now. Break into your think pairs and discuss what the chaplain means when he tells Alex, goodness is something chosen. When a man cannot choose, he ceases to be a man. Back to the scene, the class springs into action and turns their desks face to face until the whole class is paired off. Liberty and Adiz face with one another. You can see the sparks. Adiz is the first to break the silence. You new? Yeah. I'm Adiz. Liberty. Where are you from? Middletown. Where is that? Orange County. Liberty sees that it doesn't register. It's upstate. Oh, it's a nice upstate. She nods in agreement. An awkward moment of silence follows. So, uh, what brings you to the Bronx? It's clear from her reaction that it's a sensitive subject. It's complicated. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. It's okay. So, what do you guys think? Roth stands over them. I think he's saying that being able to choose right from wrong is what makes us special. It's what sets us apart from animals who can't choose because they're slaves to their nature. Impressive. Roth walks off to another pair of students. Adisa is also impressed and it shows much the chagrin of a young lady several rows over. We push in on Elana Dera. 18, a well-built Albanian-American who watches enraged as Liberty and Adonis make eyes at each other. Match two, the girl's bathroom. Alana stares angrily into the mirror and punches it with a thwack twice more. Thwack, thwack. She grips the sink below the mirror and stares at her reflection now marred by the fragmented glass that ripples outward from the impact. Tears well in her eyes. Two of her friends, Dita, who is 18 and chunky, and Flora, who is 17 and short, come to her aid, rubbing her back in an effort to calm her. It's okay. It's she's okay, a, sir. She's a thought. He's just trying to make you jealous. Alana you inspects her knuckles, bloodied by bits of glass. You should see the nurse. And tell her what? Alana picks out several shards and drops them into the sink. The door opens. The girls turn to see Liberty enter and cross to a stall. The close the door behind her. Alana calls the girls in for a huddle and whispers. They break out and surround the stall door. Alana is front and center, flanked by her lackeys on either side. A flush sounds from inside the stall. Liberty opens the door, off her fear and perplexion, as we end the teaser. Inside the girl's bathroom, Liberty tries to close the stall door. Alana pushes back, preventing her. 
What do you want? For you to hop off Addis's dick and stick to your own. My own? You don't. I'll do your face what I did in a mirror. Alana stops pushing and steps back. Liberty slams the door closed, and we hear the latch lock. You get it? Yeah. Alana looks to the others. Let's go. The moment they follow her out of the room while we hold on to the star do stall door. Moments later, Liberty emerges and crosses to the sink and stares at the reflection in the shattered glass. She turns on the sink. Outside the apartment building, a steady stream of water flows from an open fire hydrant. Scrappy, 16, a stocky Peruvian crouches down next to it. She dips her head back and soaks her hair. It's tied back by the same style pink and black bandana we saw earlier. Believe this, almost October and it's hotter than it was all summer. She looks to another girl wearing the same flag on her head. Roya, 17, Vietnamese, lit to the tits from the blunt burning between her fingers. She's focused on someone approaching. It's Liberty. Who's that? Rola shrugs. Think she FCG? Let's find out. Rola snuffs the blunt out on top of the hydrant and tucks it behind her ear. They march aggressively towards her. Liberty unslings her bag and holds it at her side, ready to swing it at them if she has to. What you jacking? Liberty has no clue what she means. Uh-huh. UFCG? Nah, she good. Triga steps between Scrappy and Rolla. Liberty nods appreciatively to Triga and continues on her way. Mom wants you inside. They follow Liberty towards the entrance, leaving Triga to watch over the street like a sentry. Inside, the li inside Liberty's bedroom, we're looking out an open window at Triga, who paces back and forth ten stories below. Hey. Back to the scene, Liberty turns from the window and sees her Aunt Victoria, 44, an African-American, standing in the doorway. She's in an FDNY-issued EMT uniform and a really good mood. How was your first day? Liberty frowns and flops down on her bed and lies on her back. What happened? I don't feel like talking about it. Victoria sits behind her and plays with Liberty's hair. Too bad. I promised to look out for you, so start talking. Nothing happened. It's just going to take some getting used to. You should look into some clubs or sports teams. Yeah. That's a good way to meet people. Looks good on your college app. Liberty nods in acknowledgement. Were Are you, you involved? In Are you involved in anything at your old school? Liberty motions towards a saxophone case in the corner. Cool. Does the school have a band? She shakes her head. You always this chatty? Liberty almost cracks a smile. All right. Victoria pats Liberty's thigh. I'll leave you alone. For now. She stands and crosses to the window. Want me to close this? I turn the air on in the living room. You leave the door open and it should start to cool off. Can you close the door? I like the fresh air. Okay. Something draws Victoria's attention outside. The sound of several young women yelling at one another can be heard from the street. Something's going down. We should move inside. Victoria slams the window shut. Outside the apartment building, Liberty's window shuts. We pan to street level where Triga stands with her shoulders hunched and fists pressed firmly together at her thigh. She stares down. Six women ranging in age from their late teens to early 20s. Gray beads sway on their necks as they run towards Trigga with bats and blades in their hands. The leader, Crystal, 22, short and husky, wields a machete. Trigga draws a Pug 22 from her pocket and pulls back the hammer and points it at Crystal. She stops. The whole squad halts and looks to one another. Trigga is joined by Mom, Rolla Scrappy, and four other girls in their late teens. They all sport pink and black bandanas. Trigga looks to Mom for the go-ahead, and Mom waves her, waves her off. Trigga's disappointment shows. Drop the machete. Crystal looks to Trigga and wisely drops the machete. 
Now the rest of you wretched hoes, drop your shit. Crystal looks at the girls and nods. There's a cacophony of clanging steel and aluminum as their weapons hit the pavement. You want to squash this? We do it 1D. No weapons. Trigger lowers the pug and hands on the trigger, ready to fire. Scrappy takes out her earrings and hands them to Rolla. Hey, you want to shake? Let's shake. Crystal nods to her biggest girl. She steps forward. Scrappy squares off with her. Both sides whoop and yell in anticipation. Scrappy swings. The biggest girl blocks it and punches Scrappy's shoulder. Scrappy staggers, keeping her, but keeps her footing, and launches another jab. Blocked once again. Scrappy throws an uppercut and cracks the biggest girl's jaw. The biggest girl goes to grapple. Scrappy dodges and comes in for the kill with a rapid series of body blows and tops, tops them off with an uppercut and a jab to the face. Blood explodes from the biggest girl's nose. She drops. A siren wails in the distance as the FCG girls retrieve their weapons. Crystal reaches for the machete, but Trigga gets there first and steps on it, dares her with her eyes. Crystal backs off and goes to help the biggest girl. We good. Crystal glares at Mom and pulls the biggest girl to her feet. The sirens glow, grow louder. Both groups take off in opposite directions. Pan up to a view of the building beneath a bright blue sky. A time lapse. Clouds zip by. The sky grows darker as day fades to night. Night becomes morning. We pan to the now empty street and resume normal time. Liberty exits the building, backpack swinging at her side. We track with her as she makes her way to the corner. Nervous, she surveys the scene. No sign of the bum or anyone else for that matter. She reaches into her pocket and takes out a single earbud and pops it in her ear. Urban pop music plays through a series of shots. Liberty waits at the bus stop with several other people of various ages and races. Later, Liberty stands on a packed city bus gazes out the windows. Liberty jaywalks and joins a line of students approaching the steps to the high school. Inside the main entrance, Liberty climbs the steps and clocks Alana and her lackeys, Dita and Flora, coming up on either side. They reach the door simultaneously and push past her, smirking. Liberty picks the earbud out and the music stops. She eyes the girls as they enter the building and steals herself. She steps inside. We hold, on to the, we hold on the steps and begin another time lapse. Students stream inside at great speed. The steps are quickly cleared of people and the building's shadow follows suit, climbing the steps, shrinking as the hours pass. We resume normal time. Inside the cafeteria, a brightly writ, lit room packed with tables full of students. Liberty carries a tray of mashed potatoes and mystery meat. She scans the crowd for a friendly face and finds one. Adis waves for her to join him and several other boys. She goes over to them and sets her tray down and sits across from Adis next to Nue, who is 18 and nerdy. He greets her with a smile. This is Liberty. Liberty, this is Nue. Hi. Nice to meet you. There's an awkward moment of silence. Nue blushes. See you around. Nue rises and fumbles with his tray and walks out of sight. Sorry, he gets a little tongue-tied around beautiful girls. Smooth talker, huh? The beautiful woman would have scored you more points. I'll remember that for next time. <laughs> next time? You just lost another point, playa. <laughs> they laugh. We pan several tables over to Alana, eyes exploding with rage. She's flanked by Dita and Flora. Dita rubs her back. It's okay. It's okay. Fish got balls. We should fuck her up right now. No. I have a better idea. She calls them in for a huddle. Later, inside the cafeteria, Dita is gone. Alana sits with Flora and watches an aide walk past her towards a phone that rings in a box on the wall. The aide answers it and scans the room. Alana stands and crosses over to him. We see them speak, but can't hear what's said over the din of the crowd. 
She points to Liberty. The aide nods and hangs up the phone and moves towards her as Alana exits via a nearby, nearby door. The aide reaches Liberty. Liberty Payne? Yeah? They need you in the main office. For what? The aide shrugs and walks off. Guess I'll see you later. Adis takes out his phone. Can I get your number? Sure. Liberty takes the phone from Adis and dials. Her phone lights up in her pocket. She ends the call and hands him the phone. See ya. Later. She exits through the same door that Alana used and enters a stairwell and climbs to the first landing, rounds the corner, and runs smack into Alana. Ah, oh, sorry. Liberty steps back and tries to skirt around her, but Alana sidesteps and blocks her way. Someone comes upstairs from behind her, and Liberty whips around and finds Fl Flo Flora, fists raised. Liberty raises an arm in defense and turns her attention back to Alana, just in time to dodge a jab to the head. Liberty catches Alana in an arm bar and propels her straight into Flora's fist. The impact sends the two girls tumbling down the steps. Liberty makes a run for it and stops halfway up the next flight of stairs. Dita comes down from above and stops and steps back on the landing. The girls lock eyes. Liberty sees the weakness in Dita's. She charges and plows through, knocks Dita on her ass, bursts through a door into a hallway. Weaves at a breakneck speed through several passersby, rounds a corner, narrowly avoids colliding, colliding with Mr. Roth. Easy. Liberty slows to a walk. We track with Roth, who continues to, towards the door to the stairwell. Alana and company come through it, still in hot pursuit. They stop when they see Roth. Looking for someone? No. What do you have now? Lunch. So why are you up here? MVP. Alana sighs and leads the girls back into the stairwell. Off Roth, gazing down the hall towards the main office, Liberty stands at the counter across from the secretary, a middle-aged Latina. Hi, Liberty Payne. The secretary stares at her blankly. I was told to come to the main office. You call for a... The other secretary, African-American, 50s, shakes her head. Sorry. Both women return to their computer screens. Off Liberty, realizing that she was set up. Outside the apartment building, we hone in on the bottom floor. In the basement, Trigga is seated on a lawn chair, surrounded by a smoky haze. She passes a blunt to Rolla, who's seated in a sofa that appears to have been dragged in off the street. Rolla takes a hit and goes to hand the blunt to Scrappy, who's seated behind it, beside her. Scrappy waves her off, so Rolla offers it to Trigga. I'm good. Rolla takes one last toke and rubs it out in an ashtray on top of an old trunk that functions as a table. Trigger's 22 lies next to the ashtray. You trust him? Who? The CG. Nah. Don't trust no one who'd mug an old lady. Scrappy and Rolla thumb through their phones. Trigger leans back and props her feet up on the chest to balance the chair, stares up at the ceiling. The phone rings by her feet. She sits up and answers it. What up? Some guy just tried to grab me. What? Trigger leaps to her feet and paces with rage. You okay? Yeah, I'm good. She stopped him. Who? Where you at? The park by the big steps. Stay there. I'm coming. We out. She pockets the pug and leads Scrappy and Rolla out of the room. Outside in the park, Yvette, 12 years old, cute kid, visibly shaken, and stands with Liberty at the top of the long flight of concrete steps. She wears a school-issued polo shirt and a pair of khakis. There she is. Yvette's face lights up at the sight of Trigga climbing the steps. She's followed by Rolla and Scrappy. They reach the top, and Yvette runs into Trigger's arms. Trigger holds her tight and gets right down to business. What he look like? I don't know. Spanish. Spanish, light-skinned, pretty skinny, around 40 years old, 5'7", maybe 5'8". Short, curly hair, some nasty-ass teeth. 
white t-shirt, shorts, forget what color, maybe yellow or orange. Trigger is amazed at her accuracy. You the girl from our block? Liberty nods. You a facial genius or something? Nah, I've seen him before. He was perving me the other day on the way to school. Well, he about to get fucked up. Which way he go? Liberty points down the steps. Do me a favor? Sure. Help us look for him while I take her home. Okay. Let me get your number. Trigger hands her phone to Liberty. Liberty looks to her with apprehension. Want to make sure we, go, we got the right nigga before we go beat his ass? Liberty punches in her number and gives the phone back. We follow all five girls down the steps to the street. Trigger sends Rola and Scrappy in opposite directions and points Liberty alongside the park. She takes Yvette the other way. We follow Liberty past a cast iron fence that lines a rocky outcrop. She gets to the corner and studies a sea of faces passing to and fro. Match two, another corner. More faces. It's time. This time it's Scrappy studying the crowd. She clocks the bum from the beginning. Across the street, panhandling outside a post office. She crosses to him and snaps a pick. Like what you see, baby? Scrappy ignores him and steps into the post office vestibule, fires off a text and waits for a response. Seconds later, her phone rings. She answers. What'd she say? Yeah, he right outside the post office. All right, hold up. He coming up the block towards you. Outside the apartment building, Trigger runs down the block alone, phone to her ear. That's him coming up on the corner? Aye, right, let's do this. She races across the street to the corner and draws the pug from her pocket and pulls back the hammer and aims for the bum. Freeze! The bum stops, raises his hands. I don't got no money. Thwack! Scrappy delivers a Superman punch to the back of his head. He stumbles and turns to see what hit him. Two more fists to his face send him reeling to the sidewalk. Trigger pockets the pug and drives a knee into his chest and yanks his head back so that he can look up into her eyes. I ain't no thief. I'ma teach you what happens to grown niggas who be trying to put their grimy hands on little girls. She stands and stomps the shit out of him. Scrappy joins in. Liberty approaches and watches with horror as we end Act 1. Inside Liberty's living room, Liberty is on the sofa, huddled over the coffee table doing her homework. She fidgets and stares off, unable to focus. She picks up her phone and starts a text to Adis, but stops. She puts the phone down and presses her thumbs to her temple, locks her fingers in an effort to focus. Victoria enters the apartment and closes the door behind her. Hi. Hey. She drops her keys in a dish by the door and crosses to the recliner next to the sofa and sinks into it. I just had the craziest shift. Yeah? Guy was almost beaten to death. Never seen somebody hurt so bad. He gonna be okay? He's in a coma. Don't know how anyone could do that to another human being. Maybe he deserved it. Victoria is surprised at, by her response. Whether he deserved it or not, you don't take the law into your own hands like that. Even if he pulls through, whoever did it is looking at attempted murder. Liberty is sombered by her response. Victoria changes gears. How was school today? Any better? Liberty shrugs. Victoria stands and pats her shoulder. Hang in there. I'm going to take a bath. She dips into the kitchen and comes back with a bottle of wine, a glass, and a corkscrew. There's a frozen pizza if you're hungry. Victoria leaves the room. Liberty picks up her phone and puts it down. She grabs a pen, turns a page in the textbook, and reads for a moment when a text notification draws her attention. She checks her phone. It's Trigger. We chillin' if you want to come down. Back to the scene, Liberty puts the phone down and returns to the textbook. Seconds later, she picks it back up and starts texting. In the basement, hip-hop music emanates from a pill music box resting on a chest. There's a small party going on around it. Trigger, Rolla, Scrappy, the other four girls from earlier, and five young men, ranging from their late teens to early 20s, drink 40s, pass around a blunt, and a bottle of Hennessy. Someone knocks on the door. 
Trigga crosses to it and looks through the peephole. She opens the door and welcomes Liberty inside with a hug. Pause that shit. The music stops. Listen up, y'all. All eyes turn to Trigger. This is my son, Liberty. She the one saved my sister from a bed all today. She wanted yous to know that. Now, where the head he at? Everyone claps and whoops. The music comes back on. Savage, or Savage, I don't know, 22, a muscle head in a sleeveless tee, hands the henny to Trigger. Trigga off offers Liberty a swig. She shakes her head. Trigga takes one instead. Instead, Like malt liquor? I don't really drink. You don't really drink? Or you don't drink? I don't. Trigga nods, clearly disappointed. That's cool. Smoke? Liberty shakes her head. Listen, I really appreciate what you did. You ever need anything, anything, you come to us. You hear? We got you. Liberty nods. She pats Liberty's shoulder and takes another swig, hands the henny off to Scrappy. Trigger crosses to Savage and grinds him to the beat. So, you guys live down here? Mom and Trigger do. I live upstairs with my family, but I'll be down here most of the time. She's cool with you being in a gang? Scrappy flashes her a questioning look and sips the henny. I'm sorry, I thought, I, I mean, isn't that what you guys are? We the sisterhood. Might look like a gang, but we ain't roll like one. We here to protect. That's why the landlord let us chill down here. Gangs be about robbing niggas. We ain't with that. We about keeping that shit off the block. But like those girls from the other day. Scrappy fixes her with another glare and takes another swig. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. I just... Should slow your roll with all the questions. Scrappy walks off, leaving Liberty alone. Tyshawn, 18, a charming African-American, moseys up to her. Hi. Hey. I like your necklace. She lifts it and dangles a black rose set in sterling silver. Liberty smiles and lets it fall to her chest. Thanks. It was my mom's. So, uh, you looking to be a sister? No, I'm looking to be a nurse. <laughs> Tyshawn laughs. Mom enters wearing a fast food uniform and a frown. She crosses to Trigga and grabs her by the upper arm and drags her away from Savage and into a small bedroom. Mom closes the door and turns to Trigga. What the fuck is wrong with you? What? Just a little get-together. I'm talking about this. She holds her phone up for Trigger to see. Need to delete that shit? Stat. Trigger takes her phone from her back pocket and sits on the edge of the bed and thumbs through it. Damn, how many times you text me? You gotta stop thinking, girl. What? Can't see our faces? You don't think the man be monitoring your shit? Bad enough you almost beat that nigga to death, you gotta go posting it? Trigger tucks her phone back into her pocket. There, all gone. Happy? Mom paces at the foot of the bed. What's she doing here? She my son, yo. She real. Saved my sister from that piece of shit. Helped us find his ass, too. Mom shakes her head in disapproval. Did she help you bust his face? Nah, that was all me. Well, me and Scrappy. Then she ain't your son. She stuck her neck out for a vet. That's sticking it out for me. What she do for me, she do for us. Ain't that how it works? Mom sits beside her and takes her hand, looks into her eyes. None of this works. We start ringing bells over every little thing. Every little thing? That grimy motherfucker had it coming. What was I supposed to do? I ain't saying he didn't, but you gotta be smart. Think, then act. You just react. Sooner or later, that shit's gonna get us locked up or worse. You feel me? Trigger nods. How's Yvette? She good. There's a knock at the door. Come in. Rola pokes her head inside.
There's a white nigger in a suit outside asking for you. Sexy motherfucker? Roll of shrugs. Guess if you and the old dudes. Mom laughs. Rolla dips back out. Who is it? Latassa. Outside the apartment building, meet Lieutenant Latassa. Early 40s, a hefty yet suave Italian American. He puffs on what's left of a fat cigar and smiles at Mom. Good to see you again, Jolene. Mom stares at him blankly, arms crossed. Come on. Our chat's really that painful. What do you want? Right to the chase then, huh? I'm on board with what I want. As far as what I need, I thought we already came to an understanding about that. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, but if I did, I'd tell you it was taken care of. Latasa laughs. Uh, see, that's the thing, Jolene. You have a way of taking care of problems that causes me problems. And when I have problems, you have problems. Catch my drift? True numbers have got to be down since we took over. They are, and I appreciate that. My superiors, their perspective is limited. They don't see all the shit that's been avoided thanks to my outreach. Now, all they see is someone all fucked up on the evening news. Doesn't matter if it's a piece of shit like Juan Gomez. Get it? What are you asking me to do? Latasa laughs. <laughs> that's cute. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Latasa flicks the cigar away. Bring your people in, or I'll bring them in. Capiche? Mom nods. Off the smoke from the cigar as we... As we cut to outside the high school. Storm clouds roll by in the background. It's a wet, gray day. The sounds of a basketball game are in progress. Inside the gym, Liberty dribbles in place at the top of the key and looks for someone to pass to. Nobody's open. Alana rushes her. Liberty pivots and raises her elbow to keep Alana at bay and cr cradles the ball with her other arm. A teammate runs behind her. Liberty fires off a bounce pass. Her teammate grabs the ball and takes it to the hoop. The gym teacher jogs along courtside and keeps her eyes on the action. Alana sees her chance and shoves Liberty on her ass. Liberty's teammate shoots and scores. A girl on Alana's team, Fatima, 17, Indian, wears a hijab and offers Liberty a hand, pulling her to her feet. Are you okay? She nods and leans with her hands on her knees, glaring at Alana. The gym teacher blows the whistle. Plays, play continues as we cut to the, to the locker room. Liberty is seated on a bench, tying her shoe. Fatima sits beside her and stuffs her gym uniform into her book bag. Both girls are back in their street clothes. There's a wall behind them leaving nowhere to go when Alana appears at the end of the bench. She looks to Fatima. Beat it, towelhead. Excuse me? Fatima starts towards her, and Liberty leaps to her feet and throws out an arm, holding her back. What do you want? Let's go, ladies. Alana glances in the direction of the t gym teacher's voice and locks eyes with Liberty. Be at the park after school. Or what? Oh, be a pussy. I don't want to fight. Then you should have stayed the fuck away from my man. Several girls walk by in the background. Alana falls in with them and passes out of sight. Fatima looks to Liberty. You going? Liberty shrugs. I'd go with you, but I have to pick up my little brother. No worries. Liberty slings her bag over her shoulder and strides towards us as we end Act one, Act 2. Outside the park, 40 teenagers congregate on a field of mana grass. Alana is among them, flanked by Dita and Flora. Her hair is tied back. She rubs Vaseline on her face. Think she'll show? Nah, she pussy. A hush falls over the crowd. The kids step back, revealing Liberty. She squares off with Alana. There's a good five yards between them. Flora and Dita join the onlookers, many of whom take out their phones th to record the action. The crowd encircles them. They circle each other. 
The crowd jeers. Alana charges. Liberty sidesteps and kicks the back of Alana's knee. Alana stumbles and regains her footing, turning around just in time to block a punch from Liberty. Alana punches back and cracks Liberty's jaw. Liberty bobs and weaves, avoiding a series of blows. She manages to get behind Alana, who tries to turn around. But it's too late. Liberty drives an elbow into her spine. Alana drops to her knees and twists her torso, raises her arms in a feeble attempt to fend off Liberty, who unleashes a flurry of blows to her head. Flora and Dita rush to her defense and push Liberty back. Trigga, Rola, and Scrappy emerge from the crowd and race to Liberty's side and pummel the shit out of Flora and Dita. Alana gets back on her feet and starts towards her friends, but halts when Liberty steps in front of her, fists raised. Alana shows her palms and nods to show that she's had enough. The sisters back off. Flora and Dita lie writhing in the dirt. Liberty turns her back to Alana and swaggers through the crowd which parts around her. The sisters follow in her wake. That was some ninja shit. Will you, where you learn to fight like that? Inside the apartment building in the basement, Trigga sits on the lawn chair, rolls a blunt on the chest. Liberty is squished between Rolla and Scrappy on the sofa. My dad, he runs a dojo. No shit? He can teach me? It's upstate. I could show you some moves, though. Scrappy looks up from her phone, enraged. Yo, check it. She hands the phone to Rolla. Rolla's pissed and passes it to Trigger. Oh, no, they didn't. Bitch is getting fucked up. No one is getting fucked up. All eyes turn to Mom, who is standing in the bedroom doorway. Trigger leaps to her feet and goes to her. They dead-ass flagging in front of our building? She gives her Scrappy's phone. Mom glances at it and hands it back unperturbed. You heard what I said. Trigger is stunned by her reaction. We ain't supposed to do dick about it? We're going to be smart about it. We're going to ignore it. Trigga throws her hands up in frustration and begins to pace. She starts to pull at her hair. Have to pick our battles. She stops in front of Mom and crosses her arms in disapproval. That's some day room shit right there, son. Mom steps to her and blasts her with her eyes. After a long beat. You need some clarification, son? Another long beat. Nah, I got you. Trigger snatches up the blunt and tucks it behind her ear and exits the clubhouse. Mom looks to the others. Anyone else unclear? The girls shake their heads. Mom steps into the bedroom and slams the door behind her. Off the girls as we cut to the apartment building roof. It's your typical New York City rooftop. Trigga is perched precariously on the ledge, legs dangling over the side. She takes the blunt from behind her ear and puts it to her lips and lights it up. She takes a puff and exhales and gazes out over the neighborhood at a large fenced-in field. Beyond it lies the hodgepodge of apartment buildings, attached homes and businesses that comprise the South Bronx skyline. Trigger looks down at her feet and takes out her phone. She makes a call, and after several rings, What up? Need you to get me a car. What you gonna do for me? Whatever you want. Off Trigger smiling smugly. Outside one of the attached houses, Liberty steps out of the gypsy cab and strolls along a tree-lined block. The right side of the tracks as evidenced by the SUVs and luxury sedans parked in the gated driveways. She reads the numbers on the doors, finds the one she's looking for, bounds up the cement steps to the front stoop. She rings the bell and watches the street with her back to the door. Adis opens it and smiles to her through the screen. Hey, come on in. He opens up the screen door. Liberty steps inside. In the living room, there's a party going on. A dozen or so Albanians, mostly males in their late teens and early twenties, drink and carry on. 
Adis leads her through the room, past some whispers and disapproving eyes, into the kitchen, where we find a beer pong game in progress. Two teams of two stand on across a table from one another. Several onlookers surround it, drinking and cheering them on. Want to play? Liberty shakes her head. Can I get you a drink? You have a soda? Adis nods and crosses to the refrigerator, takes out a two-liter bottle. He grabs a red Solo cup from the counter and pours some soda, and hands it to Liberty. He takes another cup and pumps the keg in the corner. Your parents go away? Adis fills his cup with beer. Nah, this is my brother's place. Well, technically it's my dad's. He owns a few buildings around here. Nice. What's he do? He owns a trucking company. Some vending machines, some other shit. Not sure what exactly. A real self-made man, huh? Yeah, never lets us forget it either. I came here with nothing. You do not know how good you have it. <laughs> Sounds like my dad. Always talking about how lucky I am that I didn't have to grow up in the hood. They sip their drinks in silence. Want to see my python? Python? Are you being a little generous with yourself? Adis <laughs>, laughs. His name's Jake. He's an actual snake, you know, with scales and shit. Liberty laughs. <laughs> okay, sure. Why not? Off Liberty's smile. In Adis's bedroom, a typical teenage boy's room. Liberty watches Adis reach into a tank on the floor and lift an adult python out of it and drape it over his shoulders. Touch it. He holds the tail out for Liberty. She pets it. Want to hold it? Liberty shakes her head as Adis uncoils it and lays it back in the tank. I should probably feed him. It's been a while. What does it eat? Mice, rats, rabbits. Alive ones? Adis nods. That's horrible. That's nature. He crosses to the closet and opens it. You're either a hunter or the hunted. Adis crouches down. Liberty peers over his shoulder inside the closet. We can't see what he's up to, but we can see a shit ton of cigarette cartons piled high and deep. Damn, all those for you? Nah, I'm holding on to them for a friend. Back to the scene, Adis turns around. Adis turns around, dangling a small white mouse by the tail. Wanna watch? Liberty shrieks and turns away and throws up her hands. Okay, I'm out of here. Adis laughs. <laughs> you win. Jake will have to wait. He puts the mouse back in the closet and shuts the door. What about me? Liberty steps to him. Her lips inches from his. How much longer do I have to wait? Adis goes in for the kiss. It's a passionate one. Inside a Nissan Altima, Savage is reclined in the driver's seat, grinning with pleasure. He moans and grips the wheel. Trigger lifts her head from his lap and sits up in the passenger seat and pops some gum in her mouth. Savage zips up and straightens out the seat and starts the car. Outside old Brownstone, Crystal and a half dozen of her squad are relaxing on the stoop listening to hip-hop music. The Ultima pulls up and stops with the passenger side facing them. Trigger is nowhere in sight. Savage smiles from behind the wheel. Hey, Papa Chulo. Savage motions for her to approach. Crystal hops up and strides towards the passenger door. She's a few feet away when Trigger pops up in the passenger seat and points the pug at her. And blam. The bullet rips a hole in her forehead. Crystal drops. The squad leaps to their feet and bum rushes the Ultima. It takes off with a screech of the tires. The biggest girl draws a Glock 26 and fires several rounds. One of them shatters the Ultima's back windshield. Savage drives on, on revealing an innocent bystander on the other side of the street. Evelio, late 20s, clutches his leg and limps off, leaving a trail of blood behind him. Sirens wail in the distance as we catch up with the Nissan Ultima. Trigga clutches her right breast, and blood flows from it and streams through her fingers. Shit! Shit, shit, shit! Trigger groans in agony as we end Act 3. 
In Act 4, inside the Nissan Al Altima, Savage drives and looks to trigger in the passenger seat. You be all right. Just keep pressure on it and breathe. Trigger breathes heavily. First thing we got to do is lose this car. Then we get you to my boy. Get me to the hospital. Nah, -uh. you go down, I go down. Trigger closes her eyes. Open your eyes. She opens them. Stay focused. You be all right. You just do what I say. Savage pulls over, throws the car in park, and kills the engine. Outside the industrial neighborhood, the Altima is parked on a quiet street. No one in sight. Savage exits and rounds the hood, opens the passenger door. He helps Trigger out and sits her on the curb. He sits behind her and takes off his shirt and uses it to staunch the blood. Now what? Now we wait. Hope the boots, hope the boots don't roll up before my niggas do. They do, we fucked. We pan up and look out over the desolate skyline. Night becomes morning as we cut to Liberty's bedroom. Sunlight th slips through the shades, bathing Liberty asleep in her bed. A text notification sounds from her phone on the night table. She sits up, rubs her eyes, and checks the text. She smiles, writes something in response. The sound of running water. Inside the bathroom, Liberty washes her hair in the shower. She turns off the water and opens this curtain and screams. Outside the apartment building, Mom leaves the building wearing her fast food uniform. She walks briskly towards the corner where an, when an unmarked police car rolls up. Latasa rolls out the open Latasa looks out the open window, one hand on the door, the other on the wheel. Get in. Am I being detained, officer? Latasa stares at her, clearly annoyed. I gotta get to work. How long is this gonna take? Tell him you'll be late. Mom starts towards the hood. Natasa catches her by the forearm. She glares at him. He fires back with a glare of his own. Thou shalt not fuck with me. He releases her arm and cranes his neck towards the back seat. She glances at it, looks to him with apprehension, and opens the back door and gets in. Natasa speeds off. Inside the unmarked police car, Mom stares through the protective glass at the back of Latasa's head. Tried to warn you. You plan on cluing me in? I want to help you here, but playing dumb is no way to play this. I'm not playing. You telling me you don't know what went down last night? I don't. I put that on my mother. Latasa pulls over and turns to face her. He gazes into her eyes and decides that she's being truthful. And I better get you caught up before we meet my friend. Patients ain't his strong suit. Inside Liberty's bedroom, Trigger lies in bed and watches Liberty get dressed. How'd you get in here? Trigger points to the open window. My aunt will be home tonight. You're going to have to be out before then. Okay. Where are you going to go? It's better if you don't know. Liberty nods. Can you promise me something? What? You look out for a vet? Of course. She goes over to Trigga and rubs her head. Keep her away from this shit. I don't want her turning out like me. Liberty smiles warmly. Get some rest. I'll come back to wake you later. Trigga returns a smile and closes her eyes. Liberty walks towards us on the way out of the room. Her face is full of dread. Inside Liberty's living room, during the day... Liberty closes the door to her room and sits on the couch. She takes out her phone and thumbs through it. There's a knock at the door. She guts up and crosses to it, looks through the peephole. In the hallway, Liberty opens the door for a roll and Scrappy. What's up? You get my text? Yeah, I just saw it. Haven't seen her. Scrappy and Rolla are worried. This ain't good. Liberty steps outside and shuts the door behind her. I'm sure she's fine. Her phone probably died. Nah, been too long. She'd have gotten a charger by now. This ain't like her at all. Liberty frowns and does her best to feign concern. I was going to grab a bacon egg. You want to come? 
Scrappy nods. All three girls walk off. Outside the apartment building, Liberty, Scrappity, and Rolla come out of the main entrance and walk towards the sidewalk. They're immediately surrounded by four Latino thugs, mid-twenties to mid-thirties. The leader, Anthony, 30 years old, heavy and bald, wears a big bushy goatee on his face and a 14K gold crucifix around his neck. Unlike the menacing eyes of his buddies, he looks at the girls with a countenance of kindness. ¿Cómo estás? Hoy tamás. Estamos de acuerdo, gracias. Scrappy and Rolla are surprised by Liberty's comprehension. Excuse us. She starts to walk on when two of the thugs step in front of her, barring her way. Not so fast. You're the sisterhood, yes? Who's asking? Easy there, Bonita. It'd be wise to realize that you're just a little girl playing in a big boys game. So I'll ask you one more time. Are you jacking the sisters or not? Well, yeah, she's just a friend. What if her beef you got with us is not about her? Anthony laughs and looks to his boys. You're cute. I like you. But I'll decide who's involved and who's not. Rolla's infuriated. Let's go. He starts walking. The girls remain steadfast. Vamanos. Why would we go with you? Anthony lifts his shirt, exposing his belly and the Sig Sauer P250 that's tucked into his jorts. Outside the slaughterhouse, a red and yellow storefront. Images of chickens, lambs, cows, and goats and rabbits run along a banner painted across the top. Anthony leads Liberty, Scrappy, and Rolla through the PVC curtains that hang in this entrance. The other thugs bring up the rear. Inside the slaughter slaughterhouse, Anthony takes the pack down a narrow aisle lined with caged chickens stacked high on each side. We can see from the girls' faces this place reeks of death. Anthony reaches the end and wraps his knuckles on the door. Knock, pause, knock, knock. Someone on the other side slides a plate over, creating a sliver of an opening. A pair of eyes peer through. The door opens. Anthony and the others file into a back room, a large, empty room. It's lit by sunlight streaming in through small windows set high in the cinder block walls. There's another door in the back. A monstrous man, Benjamin, who's in his 40s, stands by the door walking, watching them enter. Once everyone is inside, he closes it and walks with Anthony to the center of the room. They turn and face the girls who stand shoulder to shoulder. Liberty is in the middle. The other three thugs stand directly behind them. A man comes in through the back door. Meet Ciro Amascua. Sixties, thin, serious. Looks like he just stepped out of a 1950s Havana. Anthony and Benjamin step aside as Ciro strides up between them, looks over the girls. A hint of irritation appears on his face. Do you see her? Evelio hobbles through the back door of a pair, on a pair of crutches. He looks the girls over and shakes his head. There's a knock at the door, followed by a pause and another two knocks. Benjamin crosses to it and slides the plate over and looks through the slot. He steps back and opens the door. Mom enters. Benjamin closes the door. Scrappy sidesteps, giving Mom room to join them. Mom steps up between Scrappy and Liberty and looks to Sierra with unfailing confidence. The other girls are scared shitless. Ciro looks to Avilio. Her? Avilio shakes his head. Ciro inches up to mom, nose to nose, and stares into her soul. Do you know who I am? Yes, Mr. Amesqua, I know who you are. Sir. Scrappy and Rolla are surprised by her show of deference. And you know what brings us here today? I know what happened to your man, but I don't know if my woman was the one responsible. A woman does not put a bullet in someone's head over childish nonsense. Ciro returns to his position between Anthony and Benjamin. He folds his arms and studies the line of ladies. 
Only a monster would do something like that. His words register with liberty. He holds out an open palm, and Anthony draws the Sig Sauer and lays it in Ciro's hand. Ciro racks the slide. The girls cringe, all except for Mom, who maintains her fearless composure. He lowers the pistol and holds it at his side. Lucky for you, I am not a monster. I am a businessman. As you can see, one of my associates will be out of commission for quite some time, thanks to an associate of yours. So unless you can produce her, I'm going to need one of you to take the bullet in the thigh. Mom maintains her lock on his eyes. The rest of the girls look to one another. I might. Mom raises her hands and signals Liberty to remain silent. I'll do it. She unbuttons her pants and steps out and tops, tosses them aside. Don't let me be the... Silence. She turns so that her thigh faces Ciro. You got somebody who can sew me up? Don't think you want me showing up at the ER. I do. There is a van waiting out back. There are also some other terms to our arrangement, but they're non-negotiable, so we can discuss them later. Ready? Mom nods. She waves the girls away from her. They move off to the sides. Ciro steps up to her and points the cig at her upper thigh and fires. We hear the steady sound of a ventilation machine. From someone's point of view, looking around at an intensive care cubicle. Inside the hospital room, Juan, the bum from earlier, wakes up from his coma. The vital signs monitor screams an alert as we push in on his wrathful eyes and end pilot. Whoop, 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 whoop. Hey. No. <laughs> Clap nice. Nice. Great job, you guys. I have a microphone stand now, so I can actually clap. Wow. 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 Awesome. Wow. Hey, wow. Hey, wow. So that was great. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so thank you very much, Robert E. Dillon, for sharing with us your script, The Sisterhood. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And we had, I believe, three first-time readers today, and you guys all nailed it. So thank you very much. Um, and one of our re readers was actually legit living in the Bronx right now. So I thought that was super cool. Um, but yeah, so now we're going to start the feedback section, uh, starting with Kat. What were your thoughts on the script? Hello. Uh, I had a really good time. I just want to thank the writer for submitting the script, letting us read it because it was fun. It was well-written. It was cohesive. I have already closed it and opened the next one. <laughs> so... <laughs> just looking at it now and it's not even the right script but no it was really good fun um i mean not necessarily fun subjectively but it was it was fun to read so it would be fun to watch and it's it's well out of my realm of experience i mean i live in england we, we don't even have knives really um so guns is a ways away from so i can't really comment on its accuracy because it's just way out of my field. Uh, the only note that I actually made was uh, the spelling thing with uh, Reeks, which Kurt also pointed out at the time, so I guess you don't need to hear that again. But yeah, no, thanks. Great job. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Kat. Uh, Paul, what were your thoughts? Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Robert, for uh, for letting us read it. Uh, yeah, it's very good. Um, uh, as I am a black woman living in the Bronx... Oh, wait, no. No, I'm not. So I, I have... Uh, Absolutely no idea about any of the veracity of any of it, but it sounds it all sounds quite uh, quite realistic and um, it it moves along at a fair old pace. It's quite exciting. Um, I, I like how suddenly things ramp up from being uh, trouble at school to being uh, like gang warfare. That was quite interesting. Um, my only thought um, is when we get to the um, the um, Kind of the climax of, uh, of the end of Act Five, which is the bit where the tramp wakes up. Oh, he's a bum, but yeah, he's a tramp. We, we in England we call him tramps. You see, 
uh, he, he wakes up and he's filled with wrath and it feels like that's not quite based on all the crazy stuff that's happened up to that point it feels like that's not quite enough of a cliffhanger if that's what it's intended to be it feels like it's intended to be a cliffhanger and perhaps uh if he if he was he doesn't feel like he's enough of a threat i know he's he's kind of um he tried to to run off with that little girl but it feels like he's not really enough of a of a threat to hang like um a big cliffhanger at the end of the episode on I feel like um, it's a better cliffhanger to have the point at which she's shot as the cliffhanger rather than uh, it feels like it diminishes it slightly by going off to the uh, to the bum in the in the hospital bed waking up because they dealt with him quite easily. So it doesn't feel like it's it's really that much of a, um, of a threat. Um, it may be that in later episodes, he becomes um, very significant, but it doesn't feel significant right now. Um, that's my only uh, that's my only kind of negative criticism because uh, it was a lot of fun. So thank you very much. Uh, and I am finishing with my feedback. Mm, wait for it now. Excellent. <laughs> thank you very much, Paul. Uh, moving on now to Michael. What were your thoughts on the script? Uh, well, uh, first, I'd want to thank uh, Mr. Dylan for letting us read his pilot. Um, I really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun, and I don't usually have a lot of fun when I'm reading amateur scripts. Not to, not uh, not to make, uh, not to put anyone down, but um, this didn't feel as much amateur. I really enjoyed the entire thing. Um, oh my god. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Um, so, okay. I'm really. I, this is my kind of thing. Really, I really like ensembles like this. Um, I thought everyone was clearly, clearly, um, I thought everyone was pretty clearly defined. My only, um, my only issue was that at the beginning, it, they didn't feel um, like I didn't, like I knew them. But um, as it went on, I definitely felt that they were all single people; that they all had uh, different uh, emotions to them. Um, so, besides that, um, I had a few nitpicks. Um, a few of the character descriptions felt. Um, felt a little too much telly not showing um hot temper and a cold heart uh eyes cast a well stone cold vibe wasn't but a kind-hearted nature so uh if you could sh do do a little more telling and um, showing instead of telling uh that would that would have felt a little better with those but um i thought it moved pretty well uh the whole thing with the bum at the beginning was actually pretty uh pretty engaging i really enjoyed that so, um, oh, and also one more nitpick. Um, in Mr. Roth's class, when he has the do now up on the board, unless you're going to show in a shot the entire do now on the screen, I think it would be better if he said it. But I mean, that's, that's an opinion. But other than that, I really enjoyed it. So thank you for letting us read it. I had a lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Uh, moving on now to our narrator, Quantum. Did you have any thoughts on the script that you wanted to share? Um, not a lot of criticism. I really enjoyed it, which, uh, I, I love a good TV pilot. Um, I, I really just don't have a lot to say. It was, it was rather well written. It, it did have a bit, uh, of an unusual formatting that I haven't really seen before, but that's truly nitpicking. You know, everyone has their own style. Um, and yeah, I just, I just had a lot of fun. I like the, uh, kind of gang violence dealio but at the same time one of them is more of a kind of vigilante-esque group and i think that's uh i think that's pretty neat sweet that's it cool thanks Quan. um and last but not least script chick did you have any thoughts on the script you'd like to share I'd like to share um, Robert, thanks so much for um, having letting us read it. Um, I thought it felt really real to me, um, uh, particularly the Vaseline on the face. Like, I kind of want to go get in a fight now and see how effective that is when someone tries to grab my face. Um, but I thought just like a little detail like that was really cool. Um, also, the pink bandanas to kind of establish the gang. You know, you got the Bloods and the Crips, but then you have this new sisterhood, and they're wearing the pink and black bandanas. I just thought that was really, that was really neat. Um, let's see. Uh, all my notes are jarbled here. Let me try to. Um, I really like um, Mr. Roth. 
um, diffusing, like just kind of how he diffuses the fight. Um, it's really simple, but just like saying like, you know, you should be at lunch. I thought that was really neat. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, the, the, um, oh, there was a moment when uh, Triga and I think the mom, but they were, they were showing stuff on the phone, you know, before all the violence happens, which, which I liked, you know, that shooting where they jump them and stuff. But she was showing stuff on the phone and I didn't get to see it and I wanted to see it because I thought just so I could know really where their anger um, was coming from to make him then do the shooting. I don't remember seeing that. I also don't remember Liberty being with uh, Yvette. Uh, like when she like she saw the bum accosting Yvette and stuff like this, there seemed like a gap for me. Um, Maybe I missed it, but just suddenly where Triga, you know, gets the call from her sister and Liberty's there with her, it kind of jarred me a little bit. I wanted to see just how Liberty got involved in that situation. Um, I really like how her mom, Victoria, is kind of not there, you know, with the frozen pizza and the wine. Like that, that clearly shows to me how Liberty could potentially get involved with um, this sisterhood. Um, and whether it's through her own uh, volition of going, I like how the sisters kind of come into her life anyway, you know, when they break up the fight. I thought that was really good. Um, so, yeah. Um, oh, one thing I thought the the fight was a little bit too telegraphed between Alana. Like she, you know, was, was speaking to the aide. And I was just then kind of expecting it too much to show how it was all going to go down. Um, so it's kind of like, yeah, I'm waiting for the fight at that point. It wasn't really much of a surprise to me. And I, I kind of wish it was. Um, oh, a little note in the backpack. Um, so I really like how you show that she was bluffing, you know, when she do goes to the scanner. Personally, though, I thought it might have just been pepper spray. And I don't know if that would have sounded in a security thing anyway. Um, so maybe just having it show that her backpack didn't have any of that before then would have just worked just as well without going having to do the whole security bit um let's see uh another note was uh triga's text invite i like how liberty you know ends up down there i just think having seen so much violence in that scene before you know you write her look of horror it was a little bit too easy for me to where Liberty would just go down there um, without either more prodding from Triga, any excuses. It just seemed kind of easy for me before she's down there. Um, so I don't know. I'd like to see a little bit more re resistance in that. Um, and uh, personally, like having read Liberty, I I was kind of tracking her and I really perked up when uh, Triga, you know, the stuff with the Triga and the mom taking the bullet, like all that stuff I'm really excited about. And I know Liberty is a fish out of water, but I, I didn't really know enough about her. I'm, I'm struggling with her as your main character right now. Cause I'm not seeing as much stuff that I like as opposed to, um, your other characters, which feel really fleshed out to me. Um, so I guess, um, that character would be the one I'd most focus on. Um, cause Liberty, I just, I don't know yet enough, or she doesn't seem so active to me, um, but I like where it's going. Um, so I would watch the next episode. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Script Chick. And actually, there was one more person that would like to give feedback, uh, Human Jukebox. What were your thoughts on the script? It's me. I'm the last one. Um, I first off, thank you for letting us read your script. It was, it was great uh, to read this. Um, but first off, I, I, I do want to, I did want to echo kind of what Script Chick said about uh, Liberty uh, being written as the main character, but you you couldn't really uh, see it in terms of uh, with all the other characters. Um, but it, it's a it's a very good um, script nonetheless, and I I like the amount of um, female characters that there are in here. Um, and it's great uh, to see writing go this way, um, to have a lot of women uh, leads and women of color type of thing. Um, and it's a very good script. And, and I, I do like uh, the, juxtap the juxtaposition of Liberty's uh, fighting style to um, the hood type of um, gang violence type thing and the, the juxtaposition between those two. And I think it's a, it's a great story to tell. 
Um, and I, I, I'm also excited to see what the next episode entails. All right, sweet. Thank you, human, uh, for your feedback. Thank you all for a really great table read. Um, and we're not done yet. Uh, what we're going to do now is take a quick seven minute break uh, for anyone who wants to have a cigarette. Uh, it's been requested that i bump it up from five to seven actually eight but i'm I'm giving you seven so we're gonna have a seven minute break um and then we're gonna come back with our next pilot which is called analog by tyler hardy and teddy levine who are with us in the chat right now um thanks again to robert dylan and anyone watching submit a script at twitchtablereads.com all right we'll be back in five i mean seven seven back in seven (laughs) <laughs> Baby, do you know that's worth 